Thank you, Brother Mike, for doing a fine job leading us in our singing this morning. And thank you to all of you who are here this morning to worship the Lord. It has been a wonderful day of worship to God so far. I appreciate so much every opportunity you give me to stand before you and lead in the study from the Word of God. I thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to study the Bible with you, and I'm also thankful. I'm also thankful for the fine job that Brother Jacob did in reading to us from Luke, the 15th chapter, verses 11 through 24. I'm pretty sure that most of you here this morning are familiar with the story that is told in those verses. That is one of the most well-known stories in the history of the world. It's one of the most well-known stories in all the Bible. It's a story that for many of us we've been familiar with since the time we were very small. It is a story or a parable that involves a wealthy father who has two sons and the youngest son grows impatient. He grows impatient in his mind. His father isn't dying fast enough and he wants his inheritance. He wants his inheritance right now. He doesn't want to wait until his father finally kicks the bucket before he gets his money. He wants his money now. And so he goes to his father. And he asks for his money. He asks for his inheritance. And once he receives it, the scripture says he goes to a distant country and he wastes it. He squanders it. He squanders it on wicked and sinful living. But thankfully, once he reaches rock bottom, he comes to his senses. He remembers the blessings of his father and he goes back home and he repents and he begs and he pleads with his father for forgiveness. And to his surprise, that's exactly what he gets. His father forgives him. He welcomes him. He embraces him. He hugs him. He kisses him. He even throws him a big party to celebrate his return. Again, that is one of the most well-known stories in the history of the world. But this morning, I want you to notice with me, please, that that is not the end of the story. Verse number 24 is not the end. Of this story instead there is more there is a lot more there are actually eight more verses in this parable that are often overlooked and so when you consider those with me this morning in Luke the 15th chapter starting with verse number 25 after telling us about the celebration that the father had planned to throw because he was just so happy that his youngest son had repented and come back home in verse number 25 of the text. It says, now his older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he approached one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. Verse 28, but he, the older brother, became angry. And he was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected a command of yours. And yet you've never given me a young goat so that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, not my brother, when this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you've always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. I want you to just to ponder on those verses for just a few, just a few seconds. You know, on the surface, on the surface, it seems like what we just read here is out of place. It, it, it seems kind of random. It seems like it just doesn't fit with, with all the teaching that Jesus has been giving in, in this chapter. I mean, think about it this morning. Everything up to this point has been about things that are lost and found. 
There's a lost sheep at the beginning of the chapter that is found by the shepherd. A lost coin that is found by the owner. A lost boy that is found by his father. There are things throughout this chapter that are lost and found. And so the question is, what does this, what does this have to do with that? How does this connect to that? Why doesn't Jesus just end the story or the parable of the prodigal son with a happy ending? Why do we have eight more verses? Why do we have eight more verses about this angry older brother? Why do we have eight more verses about this angry older brother? Well, I want to suggest to you that the reason why Jesus doesn't end the parable of the prodigal son with a happy ending, the reason why he continues talking about the angry older brother is because the angry older brother represents the audience of people that he's addressing on this occasion. He represents some wicked and evil people. He represents some people who at this time, they were not celebrating the grace of God. They were not celebrating the grace of God, and that goes right up our alley because isn't that what we're talking about this year? We're talking about abounding in the grace of God, so we need to appreciate this. Look back at the beginning of the chapter in Luke, the 15th chapter, please. In Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse number 1, in Luke, the 15th chapter, beginning with verse 1, the chapter begins with these words. It says, now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them the parables in this chapter. I don't know about you, but for me personally, these two verses, Luke 15, verses 1 and 2, are marked in my Bible. They're marked in my Bible. And the reason why they are marked in my Bible, because they are in my view, especially important. They are especially important because they serve as the basis for everything else Jesus goes on to talk about in this chapter. They tell us exactly why Jesus tells all these parables in this, in, in this chapter. They tell us why he tells the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost boy. Notice how the reason why Jesus preached all these parables about lost things that were found was because of the criticism he received from the Pharisees and the scribes. The Pharisees and the scribes. The Pharisees and the scribes felt that if Jesus was really the Messiah, if he was really a man of God, that he would not, he would not have been doing what they saw him doing on this occasion. He would not have been eating with tax collectors and sinners. He would not have been nice to those people and gracious in giving them any kind of attention. He would not have been welcoming them and allowing them to be near him. These men, the Pharisees and the scribes, are criticizing Jesus because he's being gracious and kind to people who are outcasts in that society. And Jesus will combat that with parables. He's going to combat that with some parables, some parables about the amazing grace of God and the need to celebrate that grace. For example, in verses three through seven, the first parable, what do you find going on there? Well, in that first parable, in that chapter, you got a shepherd who's got a pretty big flock. He's got a hundred sheep, a hundred sheep. And despite only losing one, he searches diligently until he finds it. And when he finds it, what does he do? He celebrates. He rejoices. And then in the next parable, you got a woman who loses a very valuable coin. And Jesus says she does everything she can to find it. She sweeps the house. She lights a lamp. She searches diligently until she locates it. And once she locates it, what does she do? She celebrates. She throws a party. She rejoices. And then what does the father do in regards to his lost son? Well, beginning in verse number 20, Jesus says, That when this father saw his son returning home from a distance, he runs out to meet him. He goes to his son and he embraces him. He hugs him. He kisses him. 
He puts expensive clothes on him and forgives him. And he also celebrates. He throws a big party to rejoice. You see, in every one of the parables in this chapter, the grace of God is being celebrated. It's being revealed and it's being celebrated. But when you get to verse number 25, all of that stops. It ends. All of this rejoicing comes to a screeching halt. You see, while the loving and forgiving father celebrates the return of his son, the older brother, the older brother, he is angry. He is resentful. He is selfish and full of self-righteousness. He he has a sense of entitlement. He feels that his younger brother should not be celebrated. He should not be forgiven. He should not be allowed to just come back home and, and, and be part of the family again. You know who he reminds us of? He reminds us of Jonah, doesn't he? You remember the story of Jonah? Remember, God told Jonah to go and preach to the people of Nineveh, and Jonah didn't want to go do that. Jonah didn't want to go and preach to the Ninevites. He didn't want people who were enemies of his people, the people of Israel, to repent and be saved. And even after he finally goes to preach to those people, after God punishes him by allowing him to spend some time in a fish. Once those people repent after hearing his preaching, he's not happy about that. He pouts about that. He's angry about that. He is angry even with God that God has forgiven those people. You see, this angry brother here is just like Jonah. He's just like the prophet Jonah, and he's also just like the people Jesus is talking to in verses 1 and 2. He's like the Pharisees and the scribes. He's like these men who at this time were viewed as the spiritually elite. He's like these men who were also self-righteous and they were selfish and they walked around with a superior mindset. He's like these men who were not gracious. They were not kind. They were not meek. They were not welcoming towards forgiven sinners. This older brother represents the Pharisees and the scribes. In fact, I want to suggest that out of all the people mentioned in this parable, the older brother is the one who may challenge us the most. He may be the one that hits us right between the eyes this morning. I mean, think about it. Think about it this morning. It's not hard to see and acknowledge the fact that God is a gracious God after reading this parable. That's not hard to see and acknowledge. God is good. God is forgiving. God is loving. God is compassionate. God is a God who welcomes all sinners to come unto him and he wants all sinners to be saved. It is not hard to see and acknowledge any of those things about God after reading this parable. But it is hard to make sure we're not like that older brother, right? It is hard to make sure that when someone comes forward. Repenting of sin, I'm not thinking to myself, here we go again. Here we go again. I wonder what they've done this time. Why they why do they need to repent again? I don't believe their repentant heart is going to last very long. They don't really want to change. They mess up too much praying for those people. That's a waste of time. You see, this older brother challenges me. To make sure that. I have the right attitude if someone comes forward repenting of sin and he also challenges me to not to not look down on the people here in this community who come into this building and sit in one of these pews. He challenges me to accept. And celebrate when those people have honest hearts and they actually respond to the gospel. He challenges me not to look down on those people and just write those people off and make them feel unwelcomed and really desire to want these people to be saved because God wants them to be saved. God wants every one of these people we see as we drive down the road here to be saved and be part of his family. This older brother challenges me to not look down on the folks. Who may come into this church building off the street and sit in one of these pews. And he also challenges me to encourage struggling brethren. Whenever a brother comes forward. 
asking for prayers or encouragement because maybe he's losing some battles. Maybe he's losing the battle with alcohol right now. Or he's losing the battle with pornography. Or he's cheated on his wife. Or maybe he's experimenting with drugs. Or maybe he's involved in a very messy and scandalous sin that's going to require him spending some time in jail. If that brother or that sister is willing to repent, this older brother challenges me to check my attitude. He challenges me to avoid looking down on that brother. And canceling that brother and saying to myself, well, I'm not going to have anything to do with him. He's involved in something real messy and ugly. He challenges me to make sure that, that I encourage him. That I put my arm around him and embrace him. That I pray with him and pray for him. That I offer to help him, assist him, rejoice even over his repentance. Because God's holy angels are rejoicing over his repentance. Don't you see that there in the text? Look, look back at Luke 15 and verse 10. After Jesus tells the parable of the woman with a lost coin in Luke chapter 15 and verse number 10. Remember, she rejoiced when she found her lost coin. And Jesus said, in the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. How in the world would Jesus know that? How do you know that, Jesus? How do you know that the angels throw a party when a sinner repents? Well, how about he knows this because he's seen it? He came from heaven. He was in heaven before he came into this world and lived as a man. Jesus has seen this over and over and over again. He can testify of this firsthand. He has seen the angels throw a party when sinners repent. And you know what that means? That means that if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, or maybe you are a Christian, and you're living in sin right now, if you're willing to do what is right and come to God and seek God's forgiveness, the angels even today will throw a party. They'll throw a party in heaven, and it's not going to have anything to do with, with what's going on in Las Vegas today. It's not going to be a Super Bowl party. It's not going to have anything to do with who wins between the 49ers and the Kansas City Chiefs. God could care less about that game today. God doesn't care about that trivial stuff. You know what God cares about? God cares about this. He cares about salvation. He cares about people coming to God, coming to him and being forgiven. Jesus says that the angels throw a party every time a sinner repents and gets right with the Lord. This older brother challenges us to make sure we always celebrate the grace of God. And he also challenges us to make sure we strive to be like our father. He challenges us to always strive to make sure we're, we're striving to be like our heavenly father. I want us to understand something this morning. Going back to all the parables found here in this chapter, I know you're familiar with those parables. Everybody in those parables represents somebody. Everybody represents somebody. In the first one, the one about the, the, the shepherd who goes after that one sheep, that shepherd in the parable represents God. That's God. And the woman who searches for the lost coin, you know who that is? That's also God in that parable. And in the case of, of the older brother, what well, we've already pointed out, he represents the Pharisees. He represents the scribes. He represents the people who at this time were self-righteous and self-centered and resentful. And they did not celebrate the grace of God. And then the younger brother, the prodigal brother, well, he represents the people the Pharisees and scribes resented. He represents the tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, the people who were outcasts in society and the father in the parable of the prodigal son well, he represents God. He represents the heavenly father, the heavenly father who is forgiving and compassionate and gracious and welcomes all repentant sinners. Everybody in those parables represents someone. And here's the key thing to notice here, my friends. The key thing that Jesus is trying to do in this parable, particularly the parable of the prodigal son, is he's trying to motivate us to be like God. He is trying to motivate us to imitate God and have a heart like God. He is not, and hear me carefully, he is not trying to motivate us and urge us to be, any, to be like any of the father's sons. 
He is not trying to urge us and motivate us to be like any of the brothers. He doesn't want us to be like that younger brother. He doesn't want us to foolishly live a life of sin and then got to learn the hard way that living for the Lord is the best way to live. He doesn't want us to be like the younger brother. And he also doesn't want us to be like the older brother. He doesn't want us to be resentful. And stubborn. He doesn't want us to refuse to celebrate and come to the party and accept any kind of relationship with a forgiven sinner. He doesn't want us to be angry and pout and fold our arms and say, I'm not going over there as those brethren encourage that that repentant sinner. I'm going to stay over here. I don't want anything to do with what's going on over there. He doesn't want us to possess a spirit of ingratitude. He doesn't want us to possess a spirit where where we believe God's not treating us fair. He doesn't want us to be blind to the blessings we have right now. Of being in a relationship with the father and desire more and more and more. He doesn't want us to be miserable and jealous. He doesn't want us pointing the finger and acting as though we're more valuable to God than other people because, hey, we've done a whole lot more than them. We've been in the family longer than them. We've been faithful longer than them. He doesn't want us to talk to God in a disrespectful way and provide God with a great bullet list of all the things we've done since we've become Christians. Jesus here is not urging us to be like the older brother or the younger brother. Instead, in this parable, he is urging us to be like the father. He is urging us to imitate the actions of the father and have a heart of compassion like the father. He is not urging us to condone sin or celebrate sin. Instead, he is urging us to celebrate when people repent of sin. He wants us to be like the father. And I'm going to tell you all something that's challenging. That's challenging to me. That's challenging to me in a very powerful way. You see what Jesus is trying to challenge us to do. That challenges me as a Christian to not just be a child of the Heavenly Father, but also strive to be like the Heavenly Father. Don't just be satisfied with being a member of the church. And doing a bunch of good works in the church, but also strive to be like the head of the church. Be like Jesus. Be like God. Be holy like like God is holy. See lost people like God sees lost people. Make sure that I'm being the kind of person who loves all people like God and I'm kind and I'm forgiving and welcoming and gracious and compassionate. And I'm encouraging towards repentant sinners like God is. I have to strive to be like my heavenly father. And then the apostle Paul teaches this. We're reading Ephesians this week. I hope you're keeping up with that Bible reading because we're going to be in Ephesians four this week. And if we read Ephesians four this week, we're going to run Right into this verse right here in Ephesians chapter four and verse number 31 in Ephesians chapter four and verse number 31. The Apostle Paul says, let all bitterness. And wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ Jesus has also forgiven you. I want you to pay close attention to verse number 32. The key words to notice in verse 32 are the words just as. Just as. Just as God did this towards you, you do this towards other people. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. How many times has God been kind to you? How many times has God been tenderhearted and compassionate towards you? How many times have you sinned in your life and you begged for God's forgiveness and you had faith that God was going to keep his word and he forgave you? How many times have you done those kinds of things? Paul here is urging us. He's urging us to remember that. He's urging us to do exactly what Jesus is urging us to do. Back in Luke chapter 15, he is urging us to strive to be like the heavenly father. 
Imitate the heavenly father. Be kind. Be tenderhearted. Be forgiving. Understand that if we don't have these qualities in our hearts like the father does, bad things are going to consume our hearts. Bad things are going to invade and infiltrate our hearts. We're going to become just like the older brother. We're going to be bitter. And we're going to be full of wrath and anger and, and malice. And we're going to have hearts void of joy. And we're going to walk around selfish and self-centered. And we're going to be constantly looking for opportunities to bash other people and tear the people down and voice and voice why we don't believe that certain people should be accepted into the family of God because they've committed sins that we rank higher than others. Or maybe because they've done something to us in the past and we just won't let it go. This parable is urging us. To not be like the younger brother or like the older brother, but be like God. Be like the father and also make sure you have a relationship with the father. Make sure you have a relationship with him. You know, so often when discussing this parable, Luke 15, verses 11 down to verse number 32, we say that it's about a lost boy. It's about a lost boy, right? We say it's about a prodigal son. You've even heard me say that numerous times this, this morning. That's what we say so often, but here's the reality. The reality is this. This parable is not about one lost boy. Instead, it's really about two lost boys. This is about two lost boys. It is true the younger son is lost for a time. When he gets in his inheritance and he goes to a distant country and he wasted on sinful living. But guess what? The older son, he's also lost. He's lost. He's not right with the father either. In fact, by the end of the story, he's the only son that is lost. He's lost. His younger brother has repented by the end of the story. And he's been forgiven. But the older brother, he's still got a wicked heart. He's got a heart full of bitterness and jealousy and envy and anger. And he's going to remain outside and pout while everybody else enjoys the party. I've told you this many times before. And I, if you don't mind, I, want, I say it again. That Luke, the writer of this wonderful gospel, he loves to include these kinds of, of stories that Jesus told. Luke loves to include in his gospel stories where Jesus reverses things. He turns things upside down. He turns things on their head. For example, in the parable of the good Samaritan, who is the good guy by the end of that story in Luke chapter 10? Well, the good guy is somebody you would not expect. The good guy is not a, a Jew. It's not a priest. It's not someone we would expect to come and help this Jewish man who had been beaten and robbed and left to die. Instead, who is it? It's a Samaritan. It's someone who's part of a race of people that the Jews could not stand. He is the good guy at the end of the story. And then if you remember in the parable of the tax collector in the center in Luke the 18th, uh, chapter, the parable of the tax collector and the, and the Pharisee, I'm sorry. Remember, who is Jesus commending that parable? Well, he doesn't commend the person you would expect, not the Pharisee. His prayer is not commended by the Lord. Instead, it's the unexpected person. It's the tax collector. His prayer is commended by the Lord. And then in Luke chapter 17, remember, Jesus healed 10 lepers. And after healing those 10 lepers, only one comes back to say thank you. And it's not the person you would expect. It's not the nine Jewish guys. Instead, it is the lone Samaritan. Luke loves to put these kind of stories in his gospel. Stories where things are reversed, turned upside down. And what's going on here is no different. You see, by the end of this story in Luke, the 15th chapter, the one who was initially out of relationship with the father is in. And the one who was initially in, he's out. He chooses to be out. He chooses to be out of relationship with the father. He chooses to remain outside while the party's taking place. He chooses not to see the blessings. 
that he has before him every single day. And he rejects the father's attempt to console him and offer to continue sharing his blessings with him. This is another example of a parable where something unexpected happens at the end. And I really want us to appreciate the lesson to be learned from that. I want us to appreciate this morning that from this parable, this is what we see. This is what we see. Those with self-righteous and self-centered and jealous and bitter and ungrateful hearts are just as lost as those who are openly wicked. They're just as lost. They're just as lost as the drunkard and the prostitute and the transgender person and the homosexual and the drug addict. They're just as lost as those people. The only difference is they are too arrogant and blind to know it. They're too arrogant and blind to know it. In fact, that is really the worst situation for a person to be in. Think about it. I mean, it's one thing to be openly sinful and rebellious against God. Those people out there on the street, they know they're lost. They know they're living wicked lives. They know they're on a path right to hell. But people like the older brother, those are the people who may be going to church every single Sunday. And they're singing all these songs. And hearing all these sermons. And going to every Wednesday night Bible class, but because they look down on others. Or because they secretly harbor bitterness and hate, or maybe they walk around thinking they're better than other people. They're also lost as well, but sadly, they don't even realize it. They're so blind and so arrogant, they can't see their true spiritual condition. And so the final question is this, how does this parable conclude? Well, it concludes in verse number 32. It concludes with a lot of unanswered questions. I mean, what happens with this older brother? Don't you want to know? I want to know. Does he repent for having a self-righteous heart? Does he accept the love and consolation of his father? Does he grow up and mature and stop whining and pouting and go inside and attend the party? I want to know what happens to this guy. Jesus doesn't tell us. He doesn't tell us. The question is, what about you this morning? What about you? Where are you in your life right now? Are you like, are you like that older brother? Are you a Christian here this morning and maybe you have a heart that is wicked and it's not right with God? Do you need some help with that? You need us to pray with you and pray for you with your family. We'll be more than happy to do that this morning. Or maybe... You're like the prodigal. Maybe you have wandered away from the spiritual family. You need to repent and come back home. Or maybe you just need to come home for the first time. Come to the Lord for the first time through having faith in the Lord and repenting and being baptized for the remission of your sins. If there's anyone here this morning who needs to come to the Heavenly Father who's always waiting and ready to forgive and throw a spiritual party with the angels. You come to the front right now. Let's stand. Let's sing together. Wonderful.